Well, if you like roller coasters, you will probably be a fan of Mark chapter 8 and 9. Because in it, Jesus has been establishing his identity. He's been traveling all over Israel. And Mark's recording for us this eyewitness account of what's happened. And then in chapter 8, Jesus, who's this guy who's healed lepers, who's caused storms to cease out on raging waters, who has cast demons out of people, all these kind of things. At this point, he says, I'm the Christ, the King, and I'm going to die. So all these anticipations are building for Jesus, and it's going higher and higher and higher, and he finally goes, I am the Christ. And then it just goes over that cliff and goes down. He says, and I've come here. My ultimate purpose is to go and be treated with contempt, to be turned over, and to be killed. And so the disciples, if you can put yourself in their shoes, they think, yes, this is the king. This is the one that's going to make things right. You're going to die? That's your purpose? You must die? And so it plummets down into the valleys, and they start thinking, as, as we do, reading this, man, this is kind of brutal. The true king, the one we need, is going to die? And then right after that, Jesus says, but it's not, what I've come to establish is not weak. It's like some of you are going to see before you even die the, the kingdom of God come with power. You're like, what does that mean? And right after that, well, six days later, Jesus goes up this mountain with Peter, James, and John. It's kind of inner circle of disciples who he's pouring a little bit more into are going to be some of the chief leaders among the other leaders in the church. He takes them up on the mountain, and then he is transfigured before them. They get a glimpse of who Jesus actually is. He is eternal God. God become a man, and veiled with flesh was his glory, but then on this mountain he is transfigured, and they see him as he is. Even his clothes are shining bright, and they're terrified because they see the glory of Jesus. So it's like, the Christ is going to die, but look how glorious he is. And the disciples all see that, and they have this mountaintop experience. This is actually probably where we get the term mountaintop experience. They're up on this mountain with Jesus and see His glory. And they're like, the one that we follow, the one who is committed to us and who loves us, is the infinitely glorious King and Creator of the universe, the only God, Jesus. We're with Him. And then we pick up in verse 9 of chapter 9 as they're coming down the mountain. I want to point you to a few things today. As we go on this roller coaster, now we kind of go back into the valley as it goes Christ is going to die. He's glorious, and he will suffer, and we will suffer. So first, all things will be restored is what we'll see. The second, the cross comes before the crown. And the third, I want to ask or look at what God is doing in our sufferings. All things will be restored. The cross comes before the crown and what God is doing in our sufferings. Benjamin Franklin said that the only two things that are for sure in life are death and taxes. I would add to that, as I've said to you many times before, suffering. Death, taxes, suffering, you can bank on those three. If you are alive, you will suffer. There's no getting around it. So what does the message of Jesus bring to us? How does it help us understand our sufferings? How does it help us deal with our sufferings? Coming to Jesus doesn't mean it's all going to go away. We are going to suffer, but we have tremendous tools in the gospel to deal with those, and we see just what our sufferings are doing. But first, start with me. Look in verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, he, that is Jesus, charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man, speaking of himself, that's his favorite title, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. So again, again, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, keep your mouth shut about this. You just saw me transfigured on this mountain. You saw me in all my glory. Don't tell anyone. And if you're like me, every time that happens in Mark, you just go, that's so mean. <laughs> like when you see something so cool and glorious, you see Jesus heal someone, and he says, don't go tell everyone. You just go, come on. I don't talk to a lot of people, but something this cool happening, I want to go tell people. So Jesus again says, you saw me on the mountain, don't tell anyone. 
Why? Why does he do that all through the Gospel of Mark? It's probably because Jesus is trying to prevent everyone finding out about him in such a way that they would try to make him their poster boy to basically go and overthrow the Roman government who had taken control of their lands. The Jews, there were many revolts that had risen up and revolutions that had risen up in the last hundred years before this, and they were different Jews who would all band together to try to overthrow Rome and get them out of their country. And it seems Jesus is like, don't go tell everyone about this, because you do that, and then they're all going to try to lift me up as this great political leader, and I'm going to have to deal with all of that. I don't want to. I don't want this to get in the way of the fact that I'm not coming to take up the throne. I'm coming to take up the cross it would likely get in the way of his ultimate plan that he said, I must suffer and die for you. So don't go tell everyone. But for the first time in Mark, he actually tells them, eventually you will. He says, don't tell anyone of this until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So finally, we get some kind of, okay, we're going to be able to tell people about Jesus someday, and they will, and we will even 2,000 years later. That's why we're here. Because Jesus eventually goes, okay, now go tell everyone what you've seen. Go tell everyone about me. And so we who live 7,000 miles away from what happened in the first century, we now see and savor who Jesus is and we trust him as the glorious one who takes our sin away. He said, don't tell everyone, but you will someday. And again, you notice he promises the resurrection and the disciples have no idea what he's talking about. In the Old Testament, especially in the book of Daniel, there was this resurrection at the very end of history that was promised, that the dead will rise and the righteous will go into splendor and the unrighteous will go into judgment. And so the Jews had this idea that at the very end, everyone will be resurrected and then the great judgment will happen. But they had no category in their minds for Jesus actually saying, I'm going to die and then three days later, I'm going to be resurrected. You see how unfathomable that is. It's just like anyone today saying, hey, I'm going to die, but I'll be back in three days. Just go, what could he have been talking about? Is that a metaphor? There's no way he meant I'm actually going to die and actually going to resurrect, but he did. And he keeps promising it. And Jesus said in verse 11, or they asked him rather, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, verse 12, Elijah does come first to restore all things. So they're asking about, why do the scribes say Elijah must come? And why are they asking about it? Well, it's because God had promised it. In the Old Testament, in one of the, you know, towards the end of the Hebrew Scriptures, one of the last books there, in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, God says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, and he didn't actually die. God took him up to heaven in a chariot of fire, and so he doesn't die. And then at the very end of the Old Testament, God says, before this great and awesome day of the Lord, Elijah will come. And so the scribes had said, well, before the end, before God restores everything, Elijah has to come. And so... Disciples are like, all right, we just saw Elijah up on the mountain with you when you were transfigured. Is there there any kind of connection with this? What's going on? We know Elijah has to come before the end. And so Jesus tells them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. This great and awesome day of the Lord that's talked about in Malachi 4 is, is all through the Bible. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. It keeps being repeated. And the point of that, what it's talking about is that in the end, God said, I'm going to come to the earth and I'm going to restore all things. I'm going to heal harms. I'm going to right wrongs. I will come back. I will judge and I will also establish righteousness. He will rid the world of evil. This is the pinnacle of the good news of Christianity. It's not only personal, it's even corporate. It has this wide-angle lens that the chief end of the gospel is not just you, but it's that God is going to come back and restore all things. This is the high point of the gospel. 
that everything that has been broken because of our sin, Jesus will come back and make right. This world will be put back together. What's broken will be restored. Our hurts will be healed and our deep intrinsic longings will actually be satisfied. The gospel says nothing less than that. It says more, but it says nothing less than the world that you and I all deeply want is actually coming. Now, whether or not you believe in this, whether or not you look to the scripture as authoritative, whether or not you see and savor and trust Jesus, don't you want that to be true? Don't you want it to be true that things will not always be as they are? God says he's going to come and put things right. Can we be honest with ourselves and say, that sounds great. Now, some people say, you see, Christianity is just wish fulfillment. We have these deep longings. We want things to be better. And so some guys got around a couple hundred years after Jesus and said, hey, yeah, all these wishes you have, they're going to come true. That's what some people say. It's, it's just frankly not true, and they're lying to you because what we have in these documents are such early recordings of what actually happened and what was actually said that for 2,000 years they've held up to the greatest critics because they are actually eyewitness testimony. Christianity is not wish fulfillment, but it actually, the promises of the gospel ring so true to us, and even if you don't believe it, these good promises that God is going to come restore all things, they make everyone go, well, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> that'd be great. Why? Why does that strike a chord with everyone? It's because this is what you're built for. The reason we look at that and whether or not we believe it or not say, that'd be, I would like that. I would like all evil to go away. It's because we know this is what we ultimately need. We're built for the presence of God, and he's saying, I'm going to come back and rid, I'm going to get rid of evil and sin and injustice. And we go, that sounds great, because that's what we long for. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, somewhere in between. It doesn't matter what class you're in, what race you are. If you look out into the world, I guarantee you there are some things that make you go, that is wrong. It may be 50 different things for 50 different people, but there are things in the world we look at and say, there are injustices, there, there's racism, there's greed, there's poverty, there's sickness, there's death. We look out at certain things and say, I, I wish that would get better. We, we do that all the time when we look at the world and then sometimes we see this glimmer of hope or glimmer of somebody being kind and gracious and we'll even talk about it and if we have social media we'll be like, my faith in humanity is restored. Or this, this gave me a positive view again because we go, things are not as they should be but we get these little glimpses of light. It makes us go, maybe they could be good again. The promise of the gospel is that Jesus is coming to restore all things. Though it's not only corporate, it's personal as well. In Revelation chapter 21, at the very end, the Apostle John gets this vision. And I want to put this forward to you frequently so that we get our eyes off of ourselves and we look forward to the great promise of the gospel. Look what John says, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven, that means sky, and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. See, this corporate view, this new establishment is coming, this new Jerusalem. Jerusalem is this holy city of God in Israel. But John's saying, this is the new Jerusalem, the, the Jerusalem that the old one just pointed to, this great city God is bringing down to where heaven and earth collide and things are going to be as they should be. No more injustice. God will reign. and We will be his people. He will be our God that's this big, wide-angle corporate view, but then it gets personally focused. 
he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is the ultimate explicit teaching of of Christianity about what is being alluded to here in Mark 9 when he says, Elijah does come first to restore all things. All things will be restored. And Paul says to the church at Philippi, not just this corporate idea of restoration, but each one of you individually who has faith in Jesus, Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. See that the day of the Lord talked about in Malachi at the day of Jesus Christ in Philippians 1. Friends, you see what Paul's saying? This ultimate restoring of all things includes you individually as a person, includes me. So much so that God says through Paul, I will not rest until I've made you perfect. I will bring you to completion at that great day when all things are restored, when evil is gotten rid of, even the evil in you will be totally gone. As Peter says to the elders of the churches he's writing to in 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now he's talking to pastors specifically, but the aim is not just, oh, pastors have this extra special blessing in heaven. The idea, he's saying to these pastors, don't, don't be in this life for man, man's praise and man's glory and getting more money and being in charge and being important. It's like, that's not the point. All of that's going to fade away. So then he reminds them, as they would understand in the first century, when people ran a race or competed, they would receive some kind of wreath to put on their heads. It would be great and beautiful. Yeah, you won the race. You, com- you had all these achievements. It was a crown of glory, but it would fade. It doesn't stay tried and true forever. So Paul reminds them, when Jesus, when the chief shepherd appears, when he appears, you will receive an, receive an unfading crown of glory. The gospel says, friends, that everything Jesus has achieved in his perfectly sinless life, the fact that he obeyed God every step of the way, if your faith is in Jesus, that is transferred to you. You get to reap all of the benefits of Jesus' achievements. That's another one of those things you go, how could that, that's too good to be true. That sounds like wish fulfillment. It's as true as his cross and his resurrection. Jesus took your sin so he could give you his righteousness. Even an unfading crown of glory, you will be restored. Yet all through the Bible, and especially in this passage, we see the crown's coming for those who have faith in Jesus, but the cross comes before the crown. Jesus continues, he says, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Jesus has already taught them that the Old Testament is pointing forward to the fact that this Christ, the Son of Man, this great King that he is, must suffer and die if we're going to be saved. And so he says, yeah, Elijah does come and helps restore all things. But remember what happens to the Son of Man? Remember what's written of him? This great king, me, I'm going to suffer. And Elijah did come, and they did whatever they pleased. It can be a little bit ambiguous in this passage, but if you cross-reference throughout the gospel accounts, Matthew 11, Jesus makes explicit, and when he's talking about Elijah coming, it's, he's referring to John the Baptist. It's his cousin. He was this last prophet. He's in the beginning of the gospel accounts. He comes to prepare the way of the Lord. And we're told in Luke 1 that he came in the the passion, the zeal of Elijah. 
So when God said Elijah will come first and that'll he comes before all things are restored, he's talking specifically about John the Baptist is going to come in the same passion, the same strength, the same power as Elijah and call the people of God to turn from their sins and look to the Savior. That's what John did. And Jesus says, yeah, all things are going to be restored. But if they're going to be restored, I'm going to have to suffer. He said, yeah, Elijah comes first. And that's John the Baptist. He came, and what did they do? They did whatever they pleased with him. What do we learn about that? What is Jesus really trying to get us to? All things will be restored. The resurrection that he promises in the previous verses, that's a promise of that too. Like Jesus, I'm going to be resurrected. All things will be restored. But suffering comes first. Jesus is reminding us, says, what happened to this great prophet of God when he came, John the Baptist? He suffered. So much so that his head was eventually cut off at a feast, at a celebration, at a birthday party. This girl dances for the ruler and the ruler says, I'll give you whatever you want. She says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And he goes and has his head cut off. What happens to the great prophet? Suffering. What happens to the Son of God, the infinitely worthy King, when He comes, the Son of Man, Jesus? He went to a cross. Everything that we see in the New Testament would lead us to expect suffering. Oh yes, a crown of glory is coming, but Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross deny himself and follow me. We should not only expect suffering in our lives as Christians as, as an accident or just as a consequence of, well, things don't go as they should. Friends, ultimately, you should expect suffering in your life as a part of God's plan for you. If the greatest prophet of the Old Testament suffered and had his head cut off, if the only perfect man to ever live, Jesus, the only one without sin, if he suffered many things and was treated with contempt, you better believe you're going to suffer and I'm going to suffer too. In the movie Moneyball, if you've seen that, I think it's a great movie. There's this one part where Billy Bean, is kind of, he's the manager of this team, he goes to he goes to the house of a possible player that he wants to get on his team. This guy used to be a catcher, and he's trying to convince him to play first base for his team. So he's sitting there, and the guy's just like, uh, I mean, I really want to play. No one else wants me, but I don't play first base. And Billy Bean's sitting there with one of his other coaches, and they're trying to talk him into it. He says, Scott, it's not that hard. Scott, tell him, Wash. He asks his other coach. And without hesitation, Washington says, it's incredibly hard. She goes, no, 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 it's not. You want to play? You can play first for us. It's not that hard. Tell them. It's incredibly hard. That's how I feel when I hear people say things like, dude, if your life is difficult, just become a Christian. It makes everything easy. Like, you just put it on cruise control. You just go. It's simple. Your best life now. Help people win. All of your problems will go away. Tell them. I just want to go, it's incredibly hard. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean all of your problems melt away. It means you start walking through life with Jesus, and He makes all of your problems bearable. Because He bears the burdens with you. Because He is the infinitely valuable one that you found your value and worth in Him. And you say, yeah, the suffering, it stinks. But Jesus is worth it. If anything, friends, your life will become harder when you become a Christian. For fear of getting into this mindset of this, what's called dualism, that there's like God and Satan, and they're battling, and they're on even playing fields, and ooh, we hope light defeats darkness. That's not what the Bible says at all. It doesn't say like these two powers. It's God over everything. And yes, Satan is an enemy who hates God, who hates you, who hates me. 
God only gives Satan enough rope to hang himself. But he is said to be a lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. Now, if you're not a if you're not in Christ, you're basically on one of two teams. You're in Adam, which you would be on Satan's team, or you're in Christ because of grace through faith in him. And if you're not in Christ, why, why does the devil, why does Satan, why do demons even care what you do? Why are they going to try to attack you? Yeah, they may want to keep you where you're at. But when you get on the team, it's like, oh, you're on Jesus' team, you belong to him. That's when the battle begins. Why does the enemy want to attack you if you're not on the opposing side? When you become a Christian, it's to Christians, Satan says, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for something to devour. Your life gets harder. You start seeing Jesus and, and his path and holiness and righteousness as right and true. I want to do that. I want to do what Jesus says. When you become a Christian, you stop going, I'll just do whatever I want, and you go, no, I want to do what Jesus wants. That's difficult. No, we're not alone. Yes, he's with us, but becoming a Christian does not mean everything goes away. You won't suffer. It means, oh, you'll suffer probably even more. You'll suffer as much as anyone else, plus add on the suffering for being a Christian. Now, we don't experience a lot of that here in the West, but it's coming. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul in 2 Timothy 3, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Paul in Philippians 1, we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Paul in Romans 8. Friends, death comes before eternal life. Suffering before glory. The cross comes before the crown. You're going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. But God is doing He's doing something in it. He's doing many things in it. So I want to look at that as we close. What is God doing in our sufferings? Why do we suffer? These are some of the most important questions you can think through in your life and you can help other people think through and point them to the gospel because everyone suffers. Sometimes we suffer simply because we live in a fallen world, fractured by sin, and filled with sinners. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Things are not as they should be, and things go wrong. Sometimes we suffer because of our own sin. We make bad decisions, we make unrighteous decisions, and we reap the benefits, or we reap the spoils from those. We treat our body badly, so we get sick. We treat our friends badly, so they don't want to be friends with us anymore, and we suffer not having good friends that are there for us. Sometimes we suffer because of our own sin. Sometimes we suffer because, as a Christian, we tell people the gospel or stand true to the word. This is what's coming more and more and more on Christians in the West, is are we actually going to stand true to the gospel? Are we going to stand true on what the Word of God says, and I will abide by that? I will believe that is true. The more you do that, the more you'll suffer. Jesus says in John 15, When the world hates you, remember it hated me first. A servant is not greater than his master. If they hated me, they're going to hate you too. It should maybe cause us to step back and say, does the world like me a lot? Am I being faithful to the message of the gospel? Am I being faithful to hold out the hope of Jesus and call people to come to him? Does the world just love me? Why would that be? Sometimes we suffer because God loves us 
and disciplines those he loves. Hebrews chapter 12, the writer says, God disciplines you because he loves you. He may cause suffering to come upon you because you need to be you need to be woken up. You need to wake up from living in whatever sin you're living in. And maybe God causes something to happen to open your eyes and to shake you because He loves you. It's not punishment. It's discipline. And what is God doing in our suffering? Many times, friends, our suffering reveals in a way that nothing else can the sufficiency and value of Jesus. Sometimes you don't know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Suffering has a way of, of kind of melting away all the other things that we care about or the things that we cling to for joy or identity or status or comfort. It has a way of melting those away and you just go, Jesus is the only thing that's left. The gospel's still true. Always our suffering is used by God to transform us into the image of Jesus. Sometimes it's to reveal to us, Jesus, you're it. I so easily forget. And then sometimes, all the time, it's because he's transforming us, he's molding us to be more like Jesus. In the book of 1 Peter, Peter writes to these churches and says that we would be good, we would do good to memorize this verse. Do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Who controls the fiery trials? The Lord. Don't be surprised when you suffer. That word test, it comes upon you to test you. It's not a very good rendition of the Greek word because it means to prove. It means like gold that is put into a furnace and all the dross is melted away. All of the impurities are melted away. So God says, sometimes I put you into the fire of affliction so that everything that doesn't need to be there will just burn away and you will be more like who I've created you to be. You'll be more like my perfect son, Jesus. Peter says, don't be surprised. It comes on you to refine you, to prove you. Don't think that something strange is happening. It's making you more like Jesus. And always our suffering is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. God, who is sovereign over all, causes certain things to happen, certain sufferings for us to go through as a part of His plan so that we would all the more be prepared for when we see Jesus face to face and all sin is gone, all sickness is gone, all suffering is dead. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, we do not lose heart. Why? Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. If you know anything about the life of Paul, for him to say this light momentary affliction, and that's how he's summing up suffering, you can pretty much put any suffering you've gone through in that light momentary affliction category. Paul was stoned, and the only reason they stopped is because they thought he was dead. He was beaten with rods. He was thrown into the sea as his ship wrecked. He was abused by Jews and by Gentiles. He was constantly imprisoned. In Philippi, he was tortured. And Paul says, guys prepared to this eternal magnitude, this eternal weight of glory that we're being prepared for. Compared to that, these are all light momentary afflictions. Our sufferings here seem so serious, but they're like that compared with forever face to face with the glorious Jesus. They're preparing you for that. 
Sometimes it reveals to us how glorious Jesus is. All the time it's changing us to be more like him. And all the time it's preparing us to see him face to face. And we've seen why we suffer and what God is doing. But frankly, you're not always going to know what the answer is as you're suffering. You may not always know. Why am I suffering? Or what exactly is God doing? It may not be explicit to you, but friends, if your faith is in Jesus, you can know two things for sure. God is never punishing you. God does not punish you. And here's why. Jesus was already punished for you on the cross. The reason Jesus must suffer and then restore all things is because the only way God's going to get rid of evil without getting rid of us is if somehow someone could pay for that evil and be punished in our place. And that's the cross. In my place condemned he stood. He sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. God is not punishing you. The second thing you can remember is that God is working all all things together for good. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what kind of suffering you've gone through, you are going through, or you will go through, because Jesus suffered for you. You have the smile of God. Because Jesus suffered for you, you can stare suffering in the face and say, bring it on. Because of what Jesus has done, I know I'm not being punished. I know what God is doing. He's getting my eyes off myself and up to Jesus. He's changing me to be more like Jesus. I know that though the suffering is difficult, you can do nothing but make me a better person. You can do nothing but make me more humble, give me more faith to trust Jesus. You can do nothing but improve me. Come on, suffering. You can look at suffering and say, the worst thing you can do to me is kill me. Come on. Bring it on. You kill me, you make me better than I was before. You kill me, you send me straight to the throne. You send me straight to Jesus' presence. And so if you know Jesus has suffered for you to end all your suffering, you can look at whatever you're at and say, come on, cross. Come on, grave. I have a God, I have a King who turns all deaths into resurrections. This is the good news of the gospel, friends. Don't lose heart. Though your outer self is wasting away, you're being renewed day by day, and this light momentary affliction is preparing you for an eternal way to glory because of Jesus. Look to Him. Find everything in Him. Pray with me. Our Father, we ask You to do what we can't, to convict us of our sin, draw us to repentance, help us to cling to Jesus through faith, help us to see our suffering through the lens of the gospel, ask you to sanctify us and to save those who are not yet in Christ. May they be identified by Jesus' work through faith in him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.